Hi there. I'm speaking from within the quarantine that we're all going through. That was announced to be extended last night for 30 more days. Uh, so we are all invited to go down into the darkness and deal with our own whatever's in there that you haven't been dealing with because it's what's preventing the life force from completely expressing. And the fact that we have 30 more days means we can go even deeper and really start to heal all the stuff that's down in there. Now, I speak from experience because this, what I call my soul contract, S-O-U-L, contract with my dad began before we were born, before we were even conceived. We agreed to be each other's heavy, and boy were we. And we fulfilled our contract. And it took, when it started, it, the, the, the final part of it started when I was about, um, th uh, about 30, 28, something like that. And it ended 30 years later. So, it, no, it started when I had my Saturn return, first Saturn return, and it ended at my second Saturn return. So it was a 30-year process of actively working to clear the karma. And I will be talking about that. This is a complicated story, so I'm going to keep notes. But I want to start with something that's referring to where we are right now because it also refers to my dad and I've been thinking about my dad a lot, which I hadn't been doing ever since he died. He died about six years ago and I hadn't been thinking about him much. Uh, certainly my mom has been present with me, but not my dad. But now he is and um, this coronavirus, I think, is what has brought him to my attention. He was a doctor. I don't know what he'd be saying right now. But anyway, uh, the current event I want to um, note here that will start this Chromecast is the fact that, I don't know when it was, about a week ago or so, the Pope announced that Catholics no longer need a priest to go to confession, that they can now confess their sins directly to God. And I thought that was just a wonderful, remarkable remark because I can remember very well saying to my dad at some point in this long journey that we had with each other that why do I need a priest to access the divine? I don't need a priest to access the divine. He says, oh yes you do. You need an intermediary. Now, he was speaking from his position as a deacon. He was not only a doctor, but later in life he even became a deacon in the Catholic Church. So he was completely favored by society, you might say, because he had these high exalted roles in not just medicine, but in um, the Catholic religion. So to get him to admit anything was not easy. And the story is very complex, as I said, but it's also very beautiful in the end. So uh, first I wanna show you uh, the picture of me, my dad, and my mom when dad was, that was the day he was leaving for the Philippines uh, as a doctor in World War II. And mom is already pregnant with Marnie, my sister, my younger sister, and you know, we're all standing there not knowing what was going to happen. It turned out that she was terrified the entire time he was gone that he would not make it back. And her terror infected me to the point where I tried to just make her better all the time. I tried to make her dance and I, through my dancing and singing and laughing, I tried to make her not be so depressed. She did not, she was not capable of operating as a mom during that period. And, um, and that really affected me later on when I was a my biological mom and found myself very, very unable to really truly give myself to that process. And, so it took me many, many years before I could go back and go, what, why? What, why was it that I couldn't mother my own children? Um, why was it that I, they felt emotionally abandoned? And I have been emotionally abandoned. And I'm sure this is a story that is told many, many times by many, many people. And these are the kinds of dark secrets that we have within us that we need to uh, we need to really get in touch with during this period when we have a complete time out from our usual cultural life. Uh, as Trump says, we're battling an invisible enemy. 
And that invisible enemy is probably more inside us than anywhere else in the sense of all the stuff that we've stuffed without letting it come to the surface or by projecting it on other people and then hating them or loving them. In any case, uh, it's not real. It's a spell we cast over the world that really is a picture of our own inner life, which is in turmoil. So I'm talking about the turmoil I had to go through and that I had to spend many years in processing uh, with my dad because he was my main deal. He was the guy I came up against and I had very many of the same qualities he, he did, which was uh, disciplined, strict, controlling, duty bound, all of that. Obedient to authority, I had all of that in me too, just like he did. So, um, so his, he was gone. And when, I, when he returned, which was when I was almost three, mom tells me that he came to the door and I opened it and I looked up at him and I said, are you my daddy? And he said, yes. And I said, well, come on in and stay a while. So he did. And then he proceeded over the next six months. And I know this only because one of my siblings told me that he told him this, that uh, he proceeded to what I would call break my will and what he would call discipline me. He said it took six months to, to be able to discipline her. Uh, so I was not easy to break, but he did it. He managed, and, and he's a German. I mean, that's probably what happened to him when he was a kid. It's like, the Al if you ever read the book, Alice Miller's book, um, the, what was it called? The something of a childhood. Drama of a Gifted Child. It's a great book. If anybody's doing any work that has to do with their own inner child, read that book because she really puts you in touch with all sorts of things that you probably forgot and helps you work with them. And certainly, especially if you're German, uh, because this is, he was a strict German parent and I was raised that way, and so was he. Okay, so I can remember even sucking my thumb, and I was a thumb sucker, uh, and he forced me to stop. But I remember sitting, I remember very well, I was only three years old, I remember sitting on a, like a little table and he had bandaged my thumb so I wouldn't suck it. Well, bandaged both of them so I wouldn't suck either one. So I decided, I was like an act of total defiance. I said, I'm going to, I didn't say, I started sucking the back of my hand. There was no way he's going to stop me. I was just going to do it. Because that's what I needed. And so that's what I was doing. Okay. But he did try to control me and it did work. I became a completely modeled model child, which of course what they needed to have one child, the oldest, be the model child so everybody else would fall into line. And um, I was just really good, always good, got good grades and so forth. However, when I was nine, or when I was eight, I was determined to have a horse. And I begged my dad, I kept begging him over and over again. Here he would be sitting exhausted with a hard, hard day's work at the hospital and in his office and he's just reading the paper trying to get some quiet and I would just be badgering him please I want a horse please 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 finally after one year of my badgering him he said okay if you do the dishes for one full year without complaint and without being told to do them I'll get you the horse I couldn't believe it I instantly got a big tablet and made uh, boxes of 365 boxes and started filling them in. And I did the dishes for an already large family for a whole year when I was eight years old. And my father, who had total integrity, got me the horse. I've heard of so many little girls that wanted a horse, didn't get one, even though their parents said they could or they would. And they didn't do it. But he followed through with whatever he said he was going to do. And I have always totally appreciated him for that. And that horse saved my life because she was the big spirit that was in me that I was now riding into the sun. Okay. I remember another memory when I was a kid of sitting there with him at 3 a.m. He was
was reading the New England Journal of Medicine, I was reading the lives of the saints. We were sitting there companionably, not talking, and then we'd go into the kitchen and make ourselves some toast. And again, sit there companionably, not talking. We've both been middle of the night people where we wake up and have to do something and then go back to sleep. But that was the difference between us, the lives of the saints and the New England Journal of Medicine. When I was in high school, he gave me, I didn't ask for this, but he gave me $25 for every A. And of course I got all A's, so I got a lot of money, but I just, I didn't know what to do with it. I really wasn't interested in it. He also gave me the car that he was done with because he was getting a new car. And then I left the car door open on the street side so often that he finally took it away. And I didn't even care about the car. It was like not my value system. And uh, so then, I mean, back up just a little bit because what's really important are these early models that we have, both our, our ways of, of um, integrating them and our ways of, you know, pushing them away. And in, in his case, I also had another male model who was Fred Colo, who was happened to be his um, lab partner in medical school at the University of Minnesota, Colo to cryo camp, you know, so they were right next to each other in the alphabet. And Fred was a rich uh, and very, 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 very intelligent person and wild natured. And he would just have fun all semester. And then he'd go to my dad to help him uh, you know, pass the exams to, to tutor him to pass the exam because my dad was constantly studying. He was a diligent worker. He wasn't exactly, you know, brilliant like Colo was. Colo told me one time, he said, I remember coming home, my, my apartment building was across the street from his and I'd see him up there, you know, studying at 2 a.m. and I'd slink, slink in so he wouldn't see me. So I had both of these models when I was growing up. One of them was, you know, wild and crazy, and one was totally disciplined. And I went, basically in my life, I could say that I went from one to the other because I was just like him, and then I became just like Fred. And Fred happened to also change profess profession several times, ending up, you know, started as a surgeon, then went to be a psychiatrist, then decided that no matter what you do as a psychiatrist, they either get better or they don't. And that he really decided it wasn't worth it. So he then became a gardener and he ended up being a horticulturist uh, in Salt Lake City. And um, I love that fact that he ended up as a, as a farmer. Uh, I think that's wonderful. And my dad was the farmer for his, for their victory garden in World War I, it must have been. Two. World, no, because he was a soldier in World War II. He was born in 1916. No, he couldn't have been. Anyway, they had a garden, and he was the gardener. And I'll tell you, since we've done, since we're doing Green Acres um, Village here, I, and I, he knew that I was starting to study permaculture, and he really appreciated the fact that I was starting to tune in to um, growing things, because that's one way that he could appreciate me. Otherwise, I was more like Colo, and, and that was always a problem for him, because he and Colo, they were like, um, Colo would always tell dirty jokes, and Dad would just be furious, of course. Okay, so, oh, another, one other memory when I was a kid. Anybody that's my age will remember, if they're Catholics, the family that prays together stays together. And we did our rosary every night. We'd sit, we'd kneel there in the living room, and, and try not to kneel, de kneel, you know, hunched over. You're supposed to kneel up. And anybody that started to hunch over, he'd go, Anne, kneel up. <laughs> and we'd, you know, Hail Mary, and then the next person, Hail Mary, then the next person, Hail Mary. So it'd be take like 15 minutes out of our evening that we're all just rushing through the rosary, tell us to slow down. And then, um, of course, the phone would be ringing off the hook, mostly for Marnie, because she was very popular and um, probably her boyfriend's calling her. So it was like, it's, it's a crazy thing. That's what we used to do. And I, I don't think we were alone in the family that prays together, stays together. Okay. So, oh, another one other memory when I was young, in my early 20s, he took me to his ledger to show me how much I had cost and congratulated me 
because I had cost the least of any of his children. <laughs> so each one had a ledger. Each one had a separate ledger from him. Okay. So now we will go to what happened next. So I went through a complete sea change, which I am documenting as time goes on here. And the sea change you know, ended up with divorce, leaving children, going to California, to teach in a, an experimental college, getting fired, and starting to study astrology, all of which were anathema to my father, every single one of those uh, events. He just couldn't understand it. From model child, I suddenly became the black sheep for the family. And uh, at one point, he even told me that I wasn't welcome in his home. <laughs> that went on for a while. And then I think mom must have found out because then he reversed that and he said, no, you're welcome. But there were many nasty letters exchanged. And then one day I remember in the yurts when I was in the yurts in my forties, getting this big, thick letter from my dad. And um, the letter contained both the letter that Patrick, my first husband had sent to him about how horrible I was. And then he added some more notes about how horrible I was. So it was two letters from these two men, these two men that were the, you know, my opponents, both of them detailing and sins. I remember reading it and just, I could feel my whole body just shutting down. I just became paralyzed. It was just, oh, you know, it was just, it was really awful. Okay, then in 1985, I started to write the autobiography of my first 30 years. Uh, which I'm that I talk about that in a in the audio one of the audios writing that it was a, an amazing process uh, to go through uh, I took a whole year to do it and uh, it involved invoking memories from every single year and uh, finding the thread that connected them that had to do with the soul's choices through time and I would recommend that anybody that is in you know, a process of looking at your own life. Just look at the choices that you made and how the soul chose those choices. Um, and that you're working through some kind of karma in this lifetime. There's some kind of karma that needs to be dissolved and that that's why we incarnate is to do that. In other words, we grow. Okay. So I had to go see him. It was writing my autobiography and I had to go see him. I didn't know why. I was halfway through it, I had to go. I remember driving over from Jackson to Ketchum, where they lived at the time, and um, I was going, what am I gonna say to him? I don't know, but I got there. I might have even told this story to you already, I don't know, but it was such a big story, and each time I tell them a little differently, I haven't told it, okay. It was so huge. I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I knew I had to see him alone. And usually, mom's tries to mom is in Libra, and she tries to be the intermediary between us uh, because it was always tense between the two of us. Always tense, terrible. I mean, it was just ruined. It really was hard for everybody because this tension between dad and Anne was like the thing that defined the the atmosphere when we all got together for our vacations. Okay, so I go over there. And um, they're both there. How am I going to do this? Well, then we all go to bed. Then three o'clock rolls around. And I think, oh my God, he's probably up just the way we used to be together. So I go to my door and I peek around and there he is sitting in the living room. And I go, Dad? And he says, yes. And I look at him and say, what do you want? And I said, I didn't even know I was going to say this. I said, I think you know. And you know what he did? He patted the cushion of, of the couch. He was on, a, on one end of the couch. He patted the cushion like, come sit down. So I did. And what I found myself saying was, you and I have been at loggerheads all this time because we've been thinking with our heads and until I can learn to move my center of thought of thinking into my heart we're never going to get through this I've got to move from my head to my heart 
And I don't know how long it's going to take, but I know it's necessary because I don't want to feel estranged from you. You know what he said to me? He said, I've been thinking the same thing. It turns out that he had been seeking advice from a Benedictine monk who told him that. And so that started the second half of that 30-year process that we were in together. So it started at my Saturn return. Then when I was 45, I did the autobiography, which is halfway through the next Saturn cycle. Then we spent the next half of that cycle always not even, you know, it's not something that you keep in your mind all the time, but you know that's what your unconscious wants because you know that you've set that intention to shift that, to make a huge, huge shift between the head, from the head to the heart so that you can get back together with your father. And I'll never forget, in around, I think it was 2000, well, it was at my Saturn return, whenever that is, yeah, 2001, my friend Claudia invited me to be on a retreat at Vashon, Vashon Island, where she lives. And she said, why don't we invite your parents and see if they want to come and we just have lunch together. I was at this retreat center. And she said, that's a great idea. She had been helping me. She had been co-counseling with me all those years. Not all those years, but since, yeah, since 85, that's when I met her to help me and she she was the one that took the position of this inner child. She championed this little girl. She championed Orphan Annie while I was, you know, still, you know, in an uproar internally feeling that I was wrong, that I was bad or that he was or, you know, just, and she had been my champion and now she said, why don't we invite your parents? So we did. So here is the finale of this story. And there's a little bit more. This is the finale of my story with him. Which is that I remember seeing him. He was probably 30 feet away when I saw him come through the door. And I was alone in this big commercial kitchen. I was making sandwiches for all of us. And as, I, as he walked towards me, I saw the light of the soul dancing in his eyes and we came together and we hugged and that was the end of it there was there was nothing more to do we had done it both of us had spent all that time those 15 years working on ourselves so that we could come together again so that we could come together really for the first time and we did we completed our karma we finished our contract and it was a massive massive job and he didn't start doing that work on himself until he was like 78 years old. So he started, he started, you know, at that age, he made that kind of profound shift in himself. Now remember, he was a deacon in the Catholic Church and it was a big deal for him. And he had finally finished his medical practice and became a full-time deacon. And, and he, so now he, instead of at 3 a.m. he was studying um, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas rather than the New England Journal of Medicine. And everybody thought that this man was, you know, extremely pious and saintly, and, and he was. But at the time of his death, in his dying process, he appears to have given it up, which was stunning. It was like, and I think what happened is he had spent a lot of time thinking about and trying to process the fact that the Catholic Church was involved with pedophilia and had become aware of this. And then he was saying, well, my allegiance is to the community, not to the hierarchy. And he was trying to do that, but it just, the whole thing melted away in the end. And yet, as he said to my sister Chrissy, what if I'm wrong? <laughs> you want to go to hell? I don't know if he said that, but that was her impression, that he was conflicted. He was worried that maybe he's wrong, but it just had, it was just going, it was just gone. And here's the thing, he had, he had built this scaffolding for his life, and looking at this from the Saturn-Pluto perspective, where we are right now in the heavens, where Saturn, the scaffolding, Pluto, the life force, he had built this scaffolding to hold in his own life force, 
And as his life force starts to move out into the next dimension, he lets that scaffolding go, and then he's afraid he shouldn't have. Well, I hope I'm not afraid of whatever scaffolding that I've built up that I can let go because I know, because of experiences I've had, that death is but a new birth. It's just a new beginning. So I will leave you with this final picture of him rowing when as a young man rowing now he was rowing out to sea now he was rowing into the unknown and he was a pisces by the way and the pisces governs the ocean thanks